It's a lovely day in August 2012. It's a great day to be here with my Hawaiian shirt and several friends. Okay, we've come inside the Cathedral of St. Peter, which is what we call the Cathedral here in Geneva. And we come in on the right-hand side, there's the Chapel of the Maccabees. Maccabees, in Catholic ter terminology, means the dead. This was a funerary chapel that was built originally to house the remains of a French princess. But as you can see, um, it's been restored now to the original colors and is now a very chic place to get married if you're part of the Geneva Protestant social circles, in case anyone's looking for a place to get married. The reformers were shocked at the amount of money the Catholic Church was collecting really for salvation. Erasmus, who was a devout Catholic himself, went to visit the Pope in Avignon, and he was, a, he was one of the critics of much of what the the church did. And as he walked in to visit the Pope, the, the Pope was sitting behind a table that was piled high with gold and silver coins. And the Pope was embarrassed because he knew what Erasmus thought about this kind of thing. And he said, well, I guess the church can no longer say, silver and gold have I none. And Erasmus said, yes, and the church can no longer say either, rise up and walk. As the Catholic Church had lost its spiritual authority because of corruption. They spend enormous amounts of money on the churches and on the, the decorative stuff in the churches. All kinds of gold, silver, and, and precious stones. And the reformers thought this was really wrong. And as I mentioned last night, they also thought that some of what was going on was literally idol worship. So they smashed the, most of the statues. Um, they broke out the stained glass windows, so the art historians hate them. But for them, it was part of their spiritual warfare. They could not leave these things in place. So it wasn't until the end of the 19th century that Swiss Protestant churches started putting stained glass back into the windows. Let's say a little bit more about the Catholic Church. Um, it really was very corrupt at that time. And let me say again, I am not anti-Catholic. But at the time, many of the priests could not read. So how could they instruct anyone else? They had no idea what the Bible said. In many European towns, the way to get the job of priest, which was a good paying job, got free housing and everything, was that you had to be the one to tell the mayor of the city that the old priest had died. So you had uh, scenes where several guys would be standing around the bed of the dying priest, waiting for him to breathe his last, and then there'd be a foot race to the mayor's house, so you could be the first one to tell the mayor that the priest had died. The um, parishes, especially at the upper levels, brought in a lot of money. So those parishes went to families with political connections. So all the bishops were from noble families, and they got the money through politics or for financial reasons. And for, for all these reasons, the reformers really wanted to change everything. They wanted to get back to a a simple lifestyle and the radical gospel as it's, as it's presented in the New Testament. <clears throat> Up here on my right above is the motto that Calvin gave the city, post tenebras lux, after the darkness light. That's the present state of the city. For Calvin, the light of the gospel came in, transformed not only individuals, but the families and every sector of society, transformed the nation. But now, Geneva, although it's a beautiful, prosperous, lovely city, has gone back into spiritual things. Okay, we're here toward the front of the cathedral. Behind me is the tomb of a Protestant noble who uh, was buried as close to the altar as possible. This is actually a Catholic practice, which the Anglicans kept. But the best place to be buried is the closest possible to the altar. It's the holiest place. So if you're a noble, you're buried up there. If you're less noble, you're buried more toward the back of the church. And if you're poor, you're buried outside the church. 
Calvin, of course, hated this kind of idea, and he requested to be buried in the part of the cemetery, the park, the ways from here, Lampale, where the poor people were buried. He did not want to be buried in the church. So that immediately became the place that all the Protestants wanted to be buried, was right as near as possible to Calvin's tomb. <laughs> so having a Protestant noble buried near the altar like this, Calvin would have hated, as well as the stained glass Across from me is the pulpit where he preached every Sunday. The reason they have a, a little roof on the, over the pulpit is not to keep the rain off, although the roof did certainly leak at times, but it's because a cathedral, as I said, is not really made for speaking, it's made for worship. So in order for your voice to travel and for people to hear it, it has to be, the sound waves always rise. So if you're speaking without one of these things in a cathedral, no one can hear you. So this is called in French an abat-bois. It literally knocks down your voice. It knocks the sound waves down so people have a chance of hearing you. Back behind the pulpit is Calvin's chair. And uh, I think it's really Calvin's chair. What they do s confirm is it is definitely a 16th century chair. The tradition here, which is unbroken, is that he did sit in that chair. And I believe it is his. Um, what, what is behind me is what's called the stalls. Every cathedral had a group of canons, a special class of priests who took care of it. It was a small community, um, usually at 30 or so, sometimes less. And the cathedral was never a parish church. It was used for state occasions and, of course, the daily mass. And these guys had their own seats. This example is fascinating because the seats actually are folded up. And there's a little figure under each of them. They're made this way because a lot of times the canons were older men. And in the part of the service where they had to stand, they could actually lean up against the back of their seat when it was up. So it looked like they were standing, but they're actually leaning. But the, there's a different figure for each one. There are flowers, animals, birds, humans, angels. It's very richly decorated. Up above, you traditionally have the 11 apostles of Catholic theology. The one in Lausanne is much more finely carved. It's around in the chapel to the left when you enter the Lausanne Cathedral. I encourage you to check that one out. I found out in France how you do this, so I'm going to pass this along. If you want to make something out of wood, it's going to glorify God for centuries. You take a wood that's hard to start with, like oak, is the wood we use north of, north of the Alps. And you soak it in salt water until it becomes as hard as cast iron. And there are only two um, catches to this whole procedure. One is that you have to soak it for 100 years. So you have to believe that in your community, there will be someone who will be faithful to keep that salt water bath filled up for 100 years. Because if it ever evaporates, then the wood cracks and your project is over. You also have to believe that in your community, there will be an artist after a hundred years, three generations later, who will have the talent to carve something this fine in this detail. The Catholic Church has learned more about continuity than we have ever imagined. It is the oldest continuous institution on earth 2,000 years ago. In 2015, a church at the other end of the lake is celebrating the fact that they have an unbroken chain of daily worship for 1,500 years. Wow. There have been fire, floods, and invasion, but they have not missed a day of worship for 1,500 years. The abbot of the place is a charismatic, very committed Christian, and they're praying about how to have a celebration of those 1,500 years that will really glorify the Lord. It's the oldest place of continuous worship in the West. The only other place in the world where they've had continuous worship longer is the monastery in Simon. It's called the uh, Abbey of Saint Maurice. Saint Maurice, Maurice. Yeah, that's another story that I won't tell, but it's about the martyrdom of the Theban Legion, Egyptian Christians who were martyred by the thousands. The largest true martyrdom, most people consciously choosing to give their lives for their faith in the history of the church. And I believe that the blood of the martyrs down at Saint Maurice is one of the reasons for God's blessing in this